Thanks for watching Enabling IT Modernization, the next generation DOD mission presented by CenturyLink. I'm Francis Rose with the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. In this special program, we'll cover why IT modernization at the Department of Defense is about transformation instead of transition, some DOD specific examples of that transformation in progress, and some private sector best practices that could make that transformation possible. IT leaders will join me from the Defense Health Agency, the U.S. Coast Guard, Deloitte, and CenturyLink. It's an important topic and a great lineup, so let's get right to it. Joining me first, Pat Flanders, the Chief Information Officer at the Defense Health Agency, Rear Admiral David Dermanellian, Assistant Commandant for C4IT at the Coast Guard, and David Young, Senior Vice President of Strategic Government at CenturyLink. Thanks all very much for joining me. I want to start with you, Pat. Tell me about IT modernization at the Defense Health Agency in the midst of a whole lot of IT projects. Right, so uh, October 1st of this year, in accordance with the National Defense Authorization Act, we're going to be taking over management and administration of the, the DOD's treatment facilities. It's going to be a phased-in approach starting with um, five clinics in the southeast of the continental United States. So as part of that, we have four big initiatives. Um, our network modernization, where we're bringing the uh, existing medical networks from the services under our new uh, DHA-run medical network. Uh, support to uh, military health system Genesis, which is our new electronic health record implementation. Um, establishment of a cyber operations center, because as we grow and take over um, management administration of, of these networks and these facilities, cyber is, is really at the top of my list for priorities. Mm -hmm. And then uh, our other problem is we, we have hyper variance in medical devices across all of these treatment facilities that heretofore have bought their own things. And so uh, DHA standing up a um, medical logistics material management center that's going to try to create a catalog to help standardize those procurements. Mm -hmm. um, what are you, Admiral uh, Dermanelian, what are you looking at at IT, uh, regarding IT modernization? Well, thanks for, thanks for the opportunity. So we're looking at our enterprise mission platform, and that encompasses everything from our networks, the actual endpoint platform itself, and the back-end systems that are are enabling information to be delivered to the end users. Mm -hmm. So the Coast Guard has uh, obviously people at sea, in the air, on land, throughout the world, and so it's all about uh, modernize that mission platform so that we can deliver information on time with the proper security and, and the availability that our, our Coast Guardsmen need. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's it's more than just a platform. It's, it's all those things that are enabling information to be delivered. Mm -hmm. So with that, that's our, our primary focus and, and that includes uh, much more uh, than just uh, your networks. It, it, all those things that are enabling mobilization of, of the uh, of uh, information delivery. What are your guardsmen on the front lines telling you that they're looking for out of their network? What do they want it to be able to do in the future that maybe it, it's not today or not to its full potential? Right, uh, I mean, that's an excellent question. So it's all about getting information uh, at the tactical edge. And so those uh, young men and women who, who are at, in harm's way are asking for information to be readily available on time um, to meet their mission speed. And so many times that's uh, associated with uh, a network uh, latency issue. However, that's, that may be a symptom and not the root cause. Mm -hmm. So we realize that some of our uh, data delivery is a cause of having uh, larger applications that are not really well built for a mobilized workforce. Dave, we've talked before about mm -hmm. the fact that the kinds of modernization efforts that these gentlemen and others in DOD are undertaking, this is a mindset shift. This isn't just technology stuff and mm -hmm. plugging different things in as uh, this is a whole different way of thinking about things, it, right? It sure is, Francis. I, I just remark about when I listen to most, both Mr. Flanders and, and the Admiral talk, they didn't say one thing. There isn't a magic button to right. go hit. They started down their list, and dollars to donuts, we didn't get to the bottom of their list of what modernization really means uh, for them and their particular enterprises. And so it's really that mindset around how to incorporate many different trains of thoughts uh, into what modernization effort is. When we look at what we did in the past, we would take one component of IT and we would modernize it. Mm -hmm. And today, it's all so interconnected. And we haven't brought up cyber yet, but the ability to secure the whole thing once we modernize it is something that we have to think about the whole way through. You can't wait till the end. So mm -hmm. it's a whole different way of thinking about technology 
and driving solutions across the enterprise because everything is so intertwined at this point. And Pat, to that point of everything being intertwined, you're also in the process of collaborating with your colleagues at the Coast Guard and your colleagues at the Department of Veterans Affairs about Genesis. What kind of challenges and what kind of maybe opportunities does that kind of interactivity and interoperability need present for you? Yeah, so in, in, in the world of opportunities, certainly it's the ability to have the VA um, develop something that we can reuse, same with the Coast Guard. And so, you know, the holy grail is a single electronic health care record where when you retire from active service, you don't have to transition records, it's just a checkbox that says you've retired. Mm -hmm. On the cyber front, um, because we're all going to be using the same electronic health care record system uh, that Cerner runs out of Kansas City, there's one enclave, one security context, and we'll all be playing by the same rules. Mm -hmm. What's the significance of all of the, one of the things that MHS Genesis will do is leverage cloud technology. You've just gotten the charge from the new commandant to look at cloud and think about what its future means for the guard. Certainly there's potential there uh, where you have men and women deployed all over the place. What's the status of that? What does that look like in your view? Right, so the, uh, our Commandant, uh, Carl Schultz, uh, he has energized us by starting an early action initiative. The Coast Guard has, believe it or not, 25,000 uh, volunteers as part of the Coast Guard Auxiliary. The reason why I bring that up is one of the applications that supports those, uh, those volunteers is called auxiliary data. So our auxiliarists, uh, we need to understand what they actually bring to uh, Coast Guard missions uh, to be able to support us. And so he's asking us to move that system from, uh, internal, uh, in, from our internal data center into the cloud. And so this is basically creating a great opportunity for us to learn what industry can do to move that into the cloud so that we can have 25 essentially civilians who are part, part of our all volunteer workforce to access data so we can make the best decision of the word to leverage their services. What do you hope to learn from that exercise that will apply to other potential moves to the cloud in the future? No, that's a, again, another excellent question. So uh, the bottom line is that we need to understand how, how industry leverages uh, the data because we've learned we don't need to own all of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and so how does industry protect the data uh, to the level it needs to be protected? So going to an impact level four, impact level five facility, which cost resources and dollars, we're trying to understand that both from a cost and a performance uh, standpoint. So Dave, the, the changes these gentlemen are talking about and the changes that other IT modernization leaders are talking about in the Defense Department, the pace is amazingly fast. Mm -hmm. In some cases, it's faster than the contracting cycle. Mm -hmm. Tell me how we can fit one to the other, whichever way that should go, to, to get the kinds of outcomes that we want. Well, great point, right? Because I think we've lived through, uh, at least myself early in my career, we lived through a cycle where technology was changing about the pace contracts changed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what we've seen is contracts now are getting longer because it takes so much effort to get a new contract written, an IDIQ, and technology is cycles are shrinking even, even smaller. Mm -hmm. And so what we've got to do is get, uh, and you've heard me say this before, get into a little bit of a lifestyle of change around uh, IT and what that means and so it's not about building something that's static that's going to be around for eight or ten years it's really building something that is enables growth the unforeseen growth what we do know is we consume more of it every day um, we connect more people to our information every day so our ability to build from the foundational blocks network being one of them understanding how that network connects to a cloud how the clouds going to be connected who's going to have access and in the past just as an easy change once you got access to the network you had access to information mm -hmm. and in today's world that can't be that way up next a step back from those cases in IT modernization for a department-wide view former DOD deputy CIO Dave Wintergren on the role of the cloud new technologies like artificial intelligence and workforce matters you're watching Enabling IT Modernization, the next generation DOD mission. Stay with us. Enabling IT Modernization, the next generation DOD mission is brought to you by CenturyLink, your link to what's next. Learn more at CenturyLink.com. 
Government Matters, exploring trends in the federal community. Join Francis Rose as he covers the business of government six days a week, weeknights at 8 and 11 p.m. on WJLA 24-7 News and Sundays at 10.30 a.m. on ABC7. The Department of Defense has a new chief information officer and a new game plan that's starting to take shape. Dana Deasy took the helm in early May. He brings a real business mindset to the job as former chief information officer at J.P. Morgan Chase. In his first few months as DOD CIO, Deasy's mapping out an ambitious plan that emphasizes cloud computing and artificial intelligence. Dave Wintergren is Managing Director at Deloitte and former Deputy Chief Information Officer at the Department of Defense. Dave, you've heard the conversation up to this point. Tell me how you extrapolate what you heard at DHA and the Coast Guard over the entire enterprise of the Defense Department. And the entire enterprise is the right word. Right. I mean, the Department of Defense is a massive place. I mean, it's worth 30 seconds just to think about. Three and a half million people deployed around the world, an IT budget of over $45 billion a year. Deployed in, I'll say, uh, difficult circumstances, you know, hostile territory, submarines. And so it's a complex environment. But that said, there is lots of IT that operates inside the Department of Defense that looks just like IT in the private sector, too. And so if you look at it, you will see that DOD has two top priorities right now. IT modernization and cybersecurity. They're the twin pillars of getting IT right as we go forward. Mm -hmm. and, and DOD, like many other federal agencies and some private sector firms, is still spending the preponderance of its money on maintaining an aging set of legacy infrastructures and systems, 80% or more. And, and that is not a recipe for success in the long term. Mm -hmm. You're falling behind. Not only does it cost too much to maintain that old stuff, but it also makes it harder to implement new technologies, and it creates huge sets of cyber vulnerabilities. So there is a push across DOD to address this IT modernization issue. And I guess the good news is that, you know, the stars are aligned, no pun intended, right? From the Modernizing Government Technology Act to the President's Management Agenda to Secretary Mattis's priorities for reform. Mm -hmm. So I did something as I prepared for this that I think is exemplary of maybe the challenge the Pentagon's up against. I took IT modernization and cybersecurity, put them in little boxes like on an org chart, and was trying to figure out, okay, what are the things that then would be the reports on that kind of org chart? And as, as you say what you just said, I thought, I'm doing it wrong. IT modernization and cybersecurity, although they're pillars, and they're two separate pillars, really should be integrated together, shouldn't they, Dave? Absolutely. When Tony Scott, the former federal CIO, used to like to tell the story about it's very hard to put airbags on a 65 Mustang, <laughs> which I think is a compelling picture of this idea that, you know, uh, as the saying goes, it's better to bake your security into yeah. the solution as you're delivering it rather than to wake up and go, oh my gosh, it's not what I need it to be. How do I try to bolt it on later? Is it problematic, though, that we're talking about that concept now, just like we were talking about that concept 10 years ago, and just like we were talking about that concept 15 years ago? Well, well I am a hopeless optimist, so I will say, you know, the good news is that attention is being put on it. Uh -huh. Yes, things like cloud computing are not a new topic by any means. Uh, OMB put out its cloud first policy, what, over eight years mm -hmm. ago, and the private sector has certainly made the move to cloud. So it's important to see, and as we heard earlier from the other guests on the program, that there are huge efforts going on right now to try to address everything from moving to the cloud to also dealing with these thousands of legacy systems and the advent of all these new technologies technologies that are coming to bear. So the intersection to me, it seems, of cloud computing and the legacy systems is rethinking the way that the either the internal or external uh, customers, stakeholders of the de Defense Department will be served. One example of that is the defense travel system. Uh, DOD announced a couple of weeks back that they're going to rethink that, that they're going to, to redo that. Nobody really cares for DTS the way that it works now, and so thinking about what works for the people who are using it appears to be a big important part of what the department's going to do moving forward. Do you expect or should we expect to see more of that kind of thinking when it comes to IT modernization and how does that then mesh with the cybersecurity strategy where you have essentially systems that would then be built for their end users. 
Right. If you think about the classic IT problem set, people talk about people, process, and technology. Mm -hmm. And there is no doubt that the technology is there. And so as we turn and look at ourselves at a large organization like DOD, what we find is these thousands of legacy systems are eating our lunch in terms of money. And we need to look at them and decide, what do we want to retire? What do we want to replace? And what might we want to refresh? Mm -hmm. And that sense is on this journey about, you know, not every legacy system is bad. Maybe its only challenge is it's written in COBOL and COBOL programmers aren't getting any younger. But so the function could, that it does is still right. fine. So we could look at automated code refactoring, bring it from COBOL into a modern language like Java. Some legacy systems are just so old, they just need to go away. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at commercial off the shelf solutions. But if you go back to that people process technology thing, the most important part of that is the people issue. And the people issues revolve around two things. Not only do we have to have a retrained relevant workforce for the future that understands how to in, operate in a digital world, but also this sort of cultural change aspect about, you know, as much as we may complain about a legacy system like DTS, we still often prefer to keep it mm -hmm. because we understand how it works and we understand the processes and the future will work better if we're able to adopt a new technology and align the process to that new technology rather than keeping our business as usual process. How do you determine what the right side of that line of demarcation is for each individual application in an enterprise where you have, as you said, thousands of them that, ha that these decisions have to be made about? Yeah, well, you know, the first thing is to have a plan, mm. right? And, and it's time to move. And so there's there's a lot of pressure about cloud, and that's a great first play. If you are still managing your own infrastructure, you probably need to get over that because there are experts in the field that have a scale and allow you to only pay for what you use. And, and you know, and, and the game changed, I'll say, when the CIA moved to a commercial cloud provider. Because if the CIA can use a commercial mm -hmm. cloud provider, all of DoD can use commercial cloud providers. So as you go past that then, how can you sort of understand the portfolio of legacy systems that you have and then triage them to which ones are the okay as is, which ones are really eating my lunch right now and I have to go address, and then if I need to address them, what's the right path? And again, that path could be replace it with a commercial off the shelf solution, but be willing to change your process to align to it, mm -hmm. refactor the code into a modern language, or look for a shared service provider, because frankly, some organizations just shouldn't be in the business of doing IT operations. Mm -hmm. And some, and we shouldn't be building our old payroll system. If you work at a Fortune to 100 company, you don't build your own payroll or customer relationship management system. You use ones that are already built in and used by the many. Mm -hmm. One thing I didn't hear in there is I didn't hear a, dis uh, a thought about mission sensitivity. Is that something that should be thought of in that triage that you just discussed? Or is that not important and we're sticking to the IT principles? No, it's a, I, I think it's absolutely the most important thing. Um, it's all about the outcome, mm -hmm. as we heard in the last segment of the show. It's about the outcome, and so, you know, otherwise it becomes what I describe as shiny object syndrome, yeah. right? Like, paying for new technology will just increase your costs, unless what you're doing is all about trying to understand a mission outcome, and how can you make that outcome more effective by bringing in new technology to play. It does require us to think differently, though, about many things, how we acquire, and also thinking differently about cybersecurity. You talked about uh, the workforce, and I want to go there, especially as it pertains to cybersecurity, because one benefit to having the end users involved, or at least having an awareness of what they want, is understanding what their expectations will be once a system turns on. However, when you have a whole bunch of end users using something, they all become vulnerability points, potentially from a cybersecurity perspective. Tell me about that nexus yeah. and how you keep reins on that in the midst of and after uh, a modernization yeah, project. It's a fabulous question. There's so much in there to unpack, you know, because on the one hand, cybersecurity is a national imperative and it's everybody's job. And as, as you pointed out earlier, every end device in a hospital and every user is an issue. But frankly, cybersecurity needs to be thought about differently in this new age, right? As in the old days when everything was on premise in your enclave and security could be around the boundary, today it's very different and security in a cloud world looks differently. And frankly, the users expect to live their lives on a device like this, right? This is the way we do everything else in our life. So we want to be connected anywhere, anytime, to be able to get to the information we need. And we might not be using a device that the Department of Defense owns. Mm -hmm. Up next, industry's approach to IT modernization. We'll cover some private sector practices that could make that transformation possible. Plus, a view of RFIs around as a service and the keys to controlling the end user experience. More of this special program, Enabling IT Modernization, right after this. Enabling IT Modernization, the next generation DOD mission, is brought to you by CenturyLink, your link to what's next.
Learn more at CenturyLink.com. So far, you've heard from chief information officers at the Defense Health Agency and the U.S. Coast Guard about their priorities around IT modernization. We also covered the role of the cloud, new technologies like artificial intelligence, and workforce matters. Now let's get some insight from the contracting side of the equation. Here again, David Young, Senior Vice President of Strategic Government at CenturyLink, and joining us to wrap things up, Scott Barnett, Vice President of the Department of Defense Practice at CenturyLink. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining me. Sure. Um, Scott, I want to start with you. What's your maybe number one or top takeaways, plural, from what you've heard so far? Yeah, I think um, adaptability is the key word for me. Let's, uh, let's take the opportunity now as we're transforming to build adaptable networks to support the mission. And um, I think it's important that we build networks that are adaptable. We're not going to build a network and then find ourselves inside of a mission and wish that we could adapt to that mission in real time. Mm -hmm. And I think also for most people, when you hear the word mission, your mind goes immediately to the tactical edge or the warfighter, but there are lots of other really important uh, missions going on inside of the Department of Defense. Uh, as an example, um, education, uh, Department of Defense education activity, they've got to build a network for the future. They've got to future-proof themselves. Sure, there's a, a large transformation from uh, traditional TDM to Ethernet. I think that's just part of the story. Um, look at morale, uh, recreation, and uh, welfare. Uh, that's, a, that's a really important mission inside of DOD, and we've got to be able to build adaptable networks uh, to support those folks as well. Do we ignore those missions that are maybe not as <laughs> high profile, kind of at our own peril as people who care about what happens at I DOD? I think you, you do a little bit, but I can tell you they're no less important mm -hmm. to the folks that are designing those networks and they're supporting those constituents. And I'll pick on uh, one other one. Think about um, the commissary and exchange services. I didn't realize this, but when the consumer walks in, they want an environment and an experience just like they would get with Amazon mm -hmm. or with Walmart. Mm -hmm. So now DOD has to be able to build environments that are complementary to and on the same playing field as you would get uh, if you were just an, an average consumer. And we got to be able to bring that technology to the forefront and support those people. Dave, what's your takeaways from what we've heard so far? Yeah, it's been an interesting day, and it, uh, probably the number one thing that I walk away with, uh, if we if we look at the DoD, it's it's how that young man or woman is going to have an experience through their entire career uh, as they as they move through their military department, as they interact with the support organizations, as they move into retirement and, and into the VA, how that information for them is going to get treated just like it would with any large enterprise that they would be working for or dealing with as a, as a consumer. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting to hear uh, the conversation move away from, okay, I want to buy this thing, mm -hmm. to how that how that item interconnects with so many other aspects of running an enterprise. And uh, like Dave Winogren said, it's just an amazing size of an organization. And to know that people are beginning to view how um, uh, an employer can treat its employees as it goes through that life cycle of career with them is a remarkable thing. Scott, I wanted to ask you, you used a term that I think is interesting a few moments ago, and that is mission-driven networks. Give me an example of a mission-driven network and how it drives the delivery of that mission in the DOD space. Yeah, so I'll take it back to the warfighter because I think that's where the conversation uh, typically goes. Uh, but let's say that you've got a network built and you're inside of the mission in real time and you want to launch another drone or you want to add a joint mission partner, do you have the capability to do that in real time? Have you already planned for that? Um, so, we, so that is a mission-driven network and we, we've got to be able to bring technologies like software-defined networking to the table and I think it becomes really compelling and really interesting when we can put the orchestration tools in the hands, the command and control, if you will, 
in the hands of the end users or, or mission specialists and let them do it mm -hmm. and not having to rely on, on another third party uh, to do that for you in real time or even you know once the mission is over, it's too late. But there certainly is a support role, Dave, for CenturyLink mm -hmm. and something like that. Tell me what that looks like in light of kind of the spirit of what you just talked about, which is you're at the, you want to serve solutions and not just serve laundry lists of, uh, of items on an acquisition. I think first it starts with some vision um, and how uh, the MILDEP or DISA or the DOD is beginning to look at what that uh, mission network looks like. And to me, the mission network looks like uh, the network that you have when you're at boot camp and the whole way up to when you find yourself uh, in a theater of, of combat. And so we shouldn't have different uh, ways to connect with experience that we're going to have. That should be a, a uniform uh, way that, that we see the DOD's employee interacting. No matter where they are in the world, their experience should be the same no matter what. Because we don't, we don't want to find ourselves in a situation where we're hoping that the new app is intuitive uh, when you know it's not time to learn a new app, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, how we experience um, uh, the connection to the enterprise becomes very critical. And no matter where you go in large enterprises, the government, state governments, um, that whole foundation, that bedrock, comes from the network that is established that enables all of that connection to to occur. Scott, there are a number of new ways that the department will be able to get these transformative solutions in. Sure. Alliant Two is in the process of rolling out EIS and others. How do they all fit into this transformation puzzle, into this discussion? Well, I think anybody, um, you want to have a portfolio of vehicles at your disposal. We're super excited about EIS, and I think what that does is it, it breaks down the traditional product silos and allows um, a carrier, if you will, to bring a full solution to the end user. Alliant 2 is also a really uh, interesting vehicle. It's an IDIQ, but, but you'll be able to put product bundles together and you'll be able to, to bring those to market for the, for the government as well. Some middle ground must work there where somebody like you or, or someone else can go in, talk about prioritization, talk about some of the things that Dave Wintergren discussed on triage, and then help an agency set a strategy to move forward the way that a private sector company would go. Right, and, and Dave likes to say communicate, communicate, communicate. I, I think there's always an opportunity to communicate uh, with your mission partners communicate with the customer, the end user, and, and find the right balance of collaboration and then bring those thought processes forward. And um, I think that's the recipe for success. We have about a minute left. I have a ton more topics mm -hmm. that I'd like okay. to cover and unfortunately we don't have time, but Dave, I want to give you the final thought here. Mm -hmm. You have talked uh, at great length about all of the offerings that are going to be available as a service moving forward. We heard two very key chief information officers, IT leaders in government say they don't want to be in the infrastructure business mm -hmm. anymore. They are receptive finally to this idea of as a service. What do you see as the future there? Do you see a horizon yet or is it too early to tell? No, I, I definitely see a horizon. I think uh, we've had a great partnership across a variety of the, the civilian agencies uh, to date about uh, just network as a service. Uh, I think uh, DOD and DISA in particular, the, the vast volumes and the size that they are, um, takes a little bit time to turn and think through that process. But I think uh, network as a service and how it ties, I think that's the thing that we've seen whenever we've worked on a network as a service, it's, it's just not the circuit priced differently. It's how do we include some of the routers or switches? How do we include the LAN? Because it's okay if the network's up as the service, but if the LAN's down, it doesn't make any sense. So how about putting all of that ownership together? The technologies are extremely similar. Um, how do we put that all together that we can put in a business case for ourselves and be comfortable with on managing that risk? And then let's, let's keep it up. Let's, uh, let's do it as a service on an SLA versus on a circuit by circuit basis. Dave Young. Scott Barnett, thanks both very much for joining me. I appreciate it. And thank you for watching this special program, Enabling IT Modernization, the next generation DOD mission presented by CenturyLink. For more information on the subject matter we discussed today, go to govmatters.tv slash CenturyLink. 
for the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network, I'm Francis Rose.